I got a letter for you here, Mr. Skull. Uh, let me get it out of my bag. There you go. Thank you kindly. Uh, mine is outgoing. Thank you, Mr. Shakespeare. <laughs> oh, mail. This is Pig. I know I got one in here for you. Let me dig it out. There you go. Thank you. This is Matroshka. Here's, here's yours for today. Thank you, dear. See y'all tomorrow. Snail mail. When I talk about the mail, do you think of an email or a physical letter? I guess that depends on who you ask. When I hear the word mail, I think of a letter received to my mailbox. You might be thinking of an email, though. Communication has been an important part of our history and has evolved a lot. Today, 269 billion emails are sent each day. Compare that with the 173 million pieces of first-class mail sent each day. Email has made the process of getting a message to someone faster, but some people like to send things via snail mail. The term snail mail was coined to mock the speed at which a piece of mail made it from the person sending it to the person receiving it versus the speed of a digital message. Emails only take a few seconds to send and receive, even when going around the world. A physical letter can take a lot longer to make it to the same destination, days or even sometimes weeks. However, I know when I get a physical card in the mail with a handwritten message, it means a lot more to me than getting an e-card. Today, we're going to be learning more about the mail. How does mail travel? Mail travels on trains. Planes. Trucks and cars. Boats. And even on foot. Before we had planes or cars, mail used to travel on horseback. One very famous example of this is the Pony Express, which was a relay system of riders that connected the east and west coast with the fastest and most reliable mail service they'd ever had. Young and strong horseback riders would pass the letters from one rider to the next going as fast as they could ride across the continental U.S. in only 10 days. They traveled through storms, wind, rain, and snow to get the letters from California to the East Coast and back again. The Pony Express only lasted a year and a half from 1860 to 1861, but it made a big impression. The telegraph took its place, but we still remember the Pony Express more than 160 years later, and it shows up in songs, television shows, and movies about the Wild West. So we know the telegraph took the place of these brave writers. What's a telegraph? By 1861, the telegraph was a system of electrical wires that ran from place to place, and messages were transmitted by Morse code. You may have seen it written as lines and dots that stand in for letters. One person would send the message by tapping the signal off and on again in the pattern, and another person on the other end of the wire would hear short and long beeps in the right pattern. They would write the code down and then read out the message. It was one of the first electric instant messages. It was pretty expensive at the time, but sending telegrams was faster than sending a writer. Telegraph wires also didn't need things like sleep, medical care, or food along the way. Eventually, telegrams went out of style too when the telephone became widespread. Sending messages isn't the only thing that goes through the mail though. Packages go through there too. There are lots of different companies that deliver packages to you, but the United States Postal Service is the only one that reaches every address in the USA. How many addresses are there? 161.4 million. That's a lot of houses, apartments, businesses, and post office boxes. If you've read any of the Harry Potter books, then you probably know that the wizards send messages through Alpost. And although Owl Post isn't real, Pigeon Post was real and was used in the past. Pigeons were transported in a cage to a particular location with a message, and then the receiver of the message read it, wrote a reply, and attached the reply to the pigeon. Then the pigeon flew back home so that the original sender could read the new message. It's like texting with a bird instead of a phone. What's a stamp? Well, it's the little sticker that goes in the top right corner of your mail that shows that it's paid for and ready to be delivered. 
Stamps are how you pay for postage or pay for something to get delivered. These were first adopted in 1840 in England and 1842 in the United States. Before there were stamps, each and every letter was weighed and marked individually, and generally speaking, the mail was incredibly expensive for the average person. Everything changed in the 1840s when reform and standard rate laws were passed. Before stamps existed, the sender of the letter would post it, and the person receiving the letter would have to pay the fee to pick it up. Stamps turned that system around so the sender paid for the letter, and we still use this method today. There are lots of different types of stamps, and they all cost different amounts. The first federal American stamp was issued in 1847. It was for five cents and had a picture of Benjamin Franklin. The second stamp to be issued in the USA had a picture of George Washington, and it was for 10 cents. Stamps have little pieces of artwork on them and often have important cultural, historical, or symbolic meanings printed on them. Some other famous people who have made it onto stamps are Harriet Tubman, Sitting Bull, and Frida Kahlo. You may even have seen some of our favorite Sesame Street pals make an appearance on them. If you're sending a birthday card, you might use this stamp that says, Happy Birthday. Or if the person getting the card loves all things scientific, maybe this series of stamps about scientific innovation. Whatever the occasion, there's probably a stamp for it. Philately is the collection and study of postage stamps. You could be a philatelist without even owning any stamps because it extends to research and the general appreciation of postage stamps. Plus it's a fun word to say. Can you try it? Philately. Do, 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 Philately. Do, 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 do. Philately. Do, 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 do. Although having a pen pal sounds like your friend is a pen, it actually means you and another person write letters back and forth to each other. Many times a pen pal is someone from another country, but it doesn't have to be. It can even be someone who lives in the same city as you. Having a pen pal allows you to slow down a conversation and think about what you want to say instead of sending rapid fire digital messages. It also allows you to work on your handwriting skills to have better penmanship. Try this. Now that you're ready to start a conversation with your pen pal, let's learn how to make an envelope. Here are the only items that you need in order to make your envelope. You'll need some glue. I'm going to use a glue stick, but you could use liquid glue if you had it. And then a square piece of paper. Mine is 12 inches by 12 inches because I want to make sure that my envelope is big enough to fit the letter inside. You could use a smaller piece of paper, but that's going to result in a smaller envelope. My first step is to turn my paper so that it forms a diamond shape just like this. And now I'm going to take my left side and fold it over towards my right side. Now that it's folded over, I'm going to go ahead and crease my paper. Now that I have my crease, I'm going to open it back up and now I'm going to fold the bottom up towards the top. And I'm going to put another crease in there. Just like that. And now I'm going to open it back up again. It may be a little hard to see on camera, but I have my crease lines in my paper. And now I'm going to take my left side and fold it into the center where the crease lines meet, just like this. All right, I have my left side all creased in, and now I'm gonna do the same thing to the right, bring it into the center, and then put a crease on the right side. All right, now that I've folded in both sides, I'm going to fold my bottom portion in, but I'm not gonna fold it all the way in. I don't wanna go all the way to the center and match it up with those points. I'm gonna fold it just so that there's a little gap in between my left and my right side, just like that. See, there's a little gap right there. That's what we're looking for is that little gap. All right, now that I have that little gap, I'm going to fold both my left and right side so that this top edge is level with my point from the bottom. And I'm going to do the same thing on the right side as well. Now that we have everything like this, I've creased both my left and right side. We should have that W shape. I'm going to go ahead and crease it. I'm going to just roll the folds over just like that. And I'm gonna go ahead and crease it down here at the bottom just like this. And I'm gonna grab my glue stick. I wanted to have that crease already made so that way I can just take my glue stick. Don't go all the way to the center, but over here on the left and right sides, I'm gonna add my glue stick over here. 
There we go, I got it on my tabletop too, but that's okay. I'm gonna take this and I'm just gonna fold it over like so. And there you go, it's ready for you to put your letter inside, seal it up, and then address and put a stamp on the front. Oh boy, the year is 1701 and you're watching someone write a letter. I wonder if they wanna be my pen pal. Most likely not. Back then, in the early colonial era, commoners didn't have access to mail. That is because private businesses hand-delivered mail along informal roads like the one behind me. Mail was often dropped off at inns and taverns since no post offices existed. Mail was most likely limited to important people sending letters to other important people, like royalty or politicians. If mail was sent across the Atlantic Sea, it could take many, many months to arrive because the letters had to travel by ship. Many consider Benjamin Franklin the father of the United States Postal Service. Actually, Benjamin Franklin only served in the post office while America was still under British rule. During this time, he did do a lot to improve mail delivery. In Franklin's world, some writers produce five copies of the same letter to send by different means because not one system was reliable. Franklin improved mail delivery by surveying post offices and post roads. To find the most efficient roads, he attached odometers to mail coaches to calculate the numbers of miles driven. Once he gathered the data, he placed milestones on preferred routes to guide postmen. Lastly, Franklin established standard post rates based on distance and weight, and this finally made post offices profitable. Two years after Benjamin Franklin's death, George Washington passed the Post Office Act of 1792 in the U.S. Constitution. This act solidified the role of the post office in the United States and granted Congress the power to expand postal service to new areas of the nation. Now, with the backing of the Constitution, our growing nation was able to fund efficient roads. Later, the government was able to fund railroads that connected post offices. As technology increased, highways and even airlines were funded as well, because sending mail in an efficient manner is a part of our civil rights. For many, the post office is a visible symbol of national unity. Congress isn't playing around when they say that mail delivery is a national service. Even the most remote areas get USPS coverage. For example, the most unusual mode of delivery by the Postal Service is mule train. Since the 1930s, mules have been carrying mail and goods to the Havasupai people located deep inside the Grand Canyon. This remote location takes three hours to get down into and five hours to get back up out of the canyon. And each mule can carry up to 200 pounds. The weight is loaded equally on each side of the mule for balance. This journey is made six days a week, just like mail delivery to you or me. Today, technology plays a vital role in the delivery of mail. Machines sort letters efficiently, and not only do we transfer messages via snail mail, we also send messages to each other through the internet. As of now, snail mail is the only way to get physical packages and boxes. But who knows? Someday, technology may play a vital role in delivering boxes in the near future. How do you most often get your mail? Do you get more letters or do you receive more boxes? Would you prefer a machine to come deliver your mail or do you prefer a person or even a mule? Personally, I wouldn't mind getting a pigeon delivery every now and then. I wonder what your preference is. For most of history, letters were some of the most important ways that people communicated. For projects in history class, your teacher may have asked you to find primary sources. A primary source is a document written by or an interview with someone who is there for the event you want to know about. 
Since the people who experienced those events far in the past are dead, the only way to find out what they thought is to read what they wrote. And these are some of the letters that changed the world. The Declaration of Independence was a letter from the American colonies to the British King George III saying why they wanted to be independent. We wouldn't celebrate the 4th of July if this letter hadn't been sent. We can't ask anyone who was around in 1776, so this is the primary source we look at to find out what they were thinking. During the fight for women's right to vote, in the heat of August 1920, the country was deadlocked and couldn't decide what to do. They only needed one more state to ratify the 19th Amendment and give women the right to vote. It was a big surprise who changed the tide. 22-year-old Representative Harry T. Burns of Tennessee, a member of the opposition, voted in favor of women's suffrage that day in the Tennessee General Assembly, breaking the tie and granting women the right to vote in Tennessee and the whole USA. Want to know why? On the outside of his jacket, he wore the red rose symbol of the opposition, but in the inside pocket of his jacket, even closer to his heart, was a letter from his mother, Feb Ensminger Burns. She said, hurrah and vote for suffrage and don't keep them in doubt. When people asked him why he voted in favor, he said, I knew that a mother's advice is always safest for a boy to follow, and my mother wanted me to vote for ratification. Another famous letter is one to President Lincoln from a little girl. Now, we've all seen President Lincoln with his famous beard. Why did he grow it out? It might have been because of a letter written to him by 11-year-old Grace Bedell of New York. She wrote to him before he won the presidential election in 1860 saying, all the ladies like whiskers and that his face was too thin without them. <laughs> we can't be sure that's why he grew it, but he had a beard when he stopped by her hometown a few weeks later after he won the election on his way to the inauguration. Now these are just a few of the letters that changed history. If you want to know more, you can always go online and do a little more research. One of my favorite ways to keep in touch with friends and family is to send them a letter or a picture through the mail. Whether they live down the street or far away, it helps us to stay connected. Let me show you how to address an envelope to make sure that your letter gets to the right person. First, I'll put who the letter is to right in the middle their name, their street address, and then the city, state, and zip code at the bottom. For this letter, I'm sending it to my grandma, and she lives at 123 Park Street. That's in Fort Worth, Texas, and the zip code is 76123. Now be sure to write very clearly so that the people at the post office make sure it gets to the right person and the right place. Then I put who the letter is from at the top and over to the side. So I'll put my name, my street address, this is for the library downtown, and then the city, state, and zip code. And last but not least, I need to make sure to put a stamp at the top right corner. It, my letter is ready to be mailed. And if I start with a blank envelope like this, sometimes I like to add doodles or stickers, but I make sure not to cover up any part of who it's to, who it's from, or the stamp. Have you ever thought about writing a letter to your favorite author? My favorite story about author fan mail comes from Maury Sendak, author and illustrator of Where the Wild Things Are and many other books for kids. In an NPR interview in 1986, he told this story when Terry Gross asked him to share a favorite comment from a reader. He said, Oh, there's so many! Can I give you just one that I really like? It was from a little boy. He sent me a charming card with a little drawing. I loved it. I answer all my children's letters, sometimes very hastily, but this one I lingered over. I sent him a postcard and I drew a picture of a wild thing on it. I wrote, Dear Jim, I loved your card. Then I got a letter back from his mother and she said, Jim loved your card so much he ate it. That to me was the highest compliment. He didn't care that it was an original drawing or anything. He saw it, he loved it, he ate it. 
You probably won't eat any letters that Gint sent back to you, and you might not even get a reply. But it does make authors happy to hear how much people like their work. When you write your letter, share something about yourself and why you like this author's books. You can even make art based on their books to share with them. When you're ready to send it, put it in an envelope that you've made following Ian's instructions from earlier. Or grab one from around your house. Sometimes you can find the address written in one of the author's books. If not, an adult may be able to help you look up this information on the internet. Many authors have a special address for fan mail. If you can't find the address, send it to the publisher. Most publishers will forward fan mail to the author. Be sure to put the author's full name and address and your return address in the left-hand corner. And don't forget a stamp. Once you're done writing your letter, it's time to place it in the postal box, and a postal box looks like this. Well, in the United States, that is. Check out these other postal boxes from around the world. about mail, check out the National Postal Museum online at postalmuseum.si.edu. There you can view a lot of their collection, check out virtual exhibits, and watch this great video called Systems at Work, which shows how mail travels across the United States through our postal service. If you're at the Central Library, check out the original artwork from Rosemary Wells' Bunny Mail on the wall. Some more mail-themed books include for early elementary, Can I Be Your Dog by Troy Cummings. Arfi writes a letter to every house on Butternut Street asking to be their dog. One by one, they write him a letter turning him down. Will anyone want to take Arfi in? And Letters from Space, written by Clayton Anderson and illustrated by Susan Batori. Astronaut Clayton Anderson lived aboard the International Space Station. You can't mail letters from space yet, but this book imagines what his letters would include if he had been able to send them. Weird science, wild facts, and outrageous true stories from life in space. For upper elementary, check out Extra Credit by Andrew Clements. Abby has to write letters to a pen pal for extra credit. She is paired with Amira, a girl from Afghanistan, but her community decides that her older brother Sadid is the better writer, so the three of them write letters back and forth and become friends. For middle grade, check out Peace Locomotion by Jacqueline Woodson. This book is written as letters from Lonnie, also known as Locomotion, to his little sister. She is living in a different foster family, and he wants to be sure he writes down everything that happens while they're growing up, even though they're apart. The next book is a book of letters just for you. It's called A Velocity of Being, Letters to a Young Reader, edited by Maria Popova and Claudia Zoe Bedrick. This book is a collection of 121 letters by authors, artists, scientists, entrepreneurs, and philosophers about the impact reading has had on their lives. Some of the authors include Jane Goodall, Yo-Yo Ma, and Judy Bloom. If you are interested in having your own pen pal, ask your parent or guardian to help you sign up for one at kidsforpeaceglobal.org backslash peacefulpenpals. They'll match you with a pen pal from inside the United States or from another country. That's all for today's show. I hope you are inspired to write a letter, whether it's to someone new or someone you already know and love. See you next time. Thank you.